We're really excited for this one. Next, the two principals of one of the most compelling and influential underground bands of the 80s punk and alternative scene. Give their own personal takes on an indie record that has been called one of the finest recordings of its genre. Released in 1980, this album has been named on so many top 10 lists, we could never cover them all here. A song from it, the main song from it, has been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It shaped punk, it shaped alternative, Americana, folk. Stay tuned for a legendary interview coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever spent hours upon hours trying to save the princess on the original Super Mario Brothers on the NES, you're going to dig this channel. Nostalgia all the time. Make sure to subscribe below right now, clicking on the red button. X, the underground band that changed everything in the 80s. If you haven't heard of them or listened to them, you need to. Trust me. Led by co-vocalist Exene Cervenka, Vocalist, bassist John Doe, guitarist Billy Zoom, and drummer DJ Bonebreak. Definitely one of the coolest band names ever. The band was founded by bassist singer John Doe and guitarist Billy Zoom. Then John Doe decided to bring in his poetry writing girlfriend, Srivanka, to band practices. And not long after that, she joined the band as a vocalist. The drummer, DJ Bonebreak, was the last of the original members to join after leaving local group The Eyes. He also filled in on drums for the Germs, so he had instant cred. They started to play gigs, and then they were signed by the big indie label Slash. The Doors legend Ray Manzarek would produce their debut album, Los Angeles, which was indie punk by the way of rockabilly and folk, with pure poetic lyrics and out-of-left-field harmonies by Doe and Cervenka. Los Angeles was the talk of the underground and influenced everything, and I mean everything that came after it. Though the band has created many albums across the 80s that define the time, it's the debut that still throws people for a loop. I heard the album when I was about nine years old from my punk aunt who lent me her copy. I got my first taste of musical whiplash as I was transported to another dimension entirely. I mean, it was completely out of the realm of the, the radio-friendly rock and pop that I was used to. It's like this deep, dark musical secret, and I meant to keep that secret. Though, the cat's out of the bag now. This album is pretty perfect. I had to pinch myself when I was able to sit down with both Exene and John to discuss this post-punk masterwork. Coming up, they both give their recollections of forming the band or recording the key songs from this album. As we go into this interview, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, that helps to make this possible. The glasses you see me uh, wearing every day, I love them. You can get a pair for every day of the week because they're so cost-effective and so quality. You'll be a customer for life, believe me. Simply go to zenny.com, pick out a few pair, and see how they look before you buy with Zenny's amazing mirror feature. Here are John Doe and Exene with the story of Los Angeles. <laughs> Well, and you moved to L.A. in 76. What fueled that scene, in your opinion? Just misfits, people that didn't fit in elsewhere. You know, everyone just played, tried to play in bands and tried to play nice with other people. And everybody was always like, oh, you don't play, you know, you don't play as, you don't play good enough. Or you don't sing right. Or you don't, you know, blah, blah, bullshit, bullshit. And it was just like people were fed up with uh, Boston and, and uh, not yeah. the city, but yeah. the band. Um, they're fed up with just uh, all this virtuoso blah blah wank wank. <laughs> you know, <it's> like... <laughs> this was the first record I heard of X, of course, you know, mm -hmm. and I remember just it was different to me. You're right, everybody yeah. sounded different, it was different than the Ramones. It really was like why I love The Clash so much and why they were my favorite bands. They were talking about a lot of different things. Right. And so were you guys. That's something you guys have always had, that rebellious spirit of punk 
uncompromising honesty that was different than the other punk bands that were in the LA scene, like Circle Jerks. Germs. The Dickies or any of those guys. What was it uh, that you were trying to say? What was it that inspired you? Um, it was just the collection of all four of us. Billy added um, his vast knowledge of music, but he put that to the side so that he could play what we were doing. Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean? You know, Exene and I were both poets and, and uh, believed in the power that that could have without getting too pretentious. And, and even more than, than the rebellious spirit or the DIY ethics or ethos, it's more just the, the freedom. So I went to LA in search of the bohemian life and I found it. And Exene didn't know why she was going. And Exene didn't hadn't been in a band. So when I asked her if you if she would, you know, come and try singing some stuff, she said, sure, what have I got to lose? This record was, uh, I mean, it's, it's been on every list you can think of. In fact, just last week, I saw the top 10 punk albums of all time. It was also on the top 100 albums of the 80s. It's on every list. Your phone's off the hook. Tell me about that song. Well, I wrote the words in New York when we were on our first trip to New York. I think it was 77, maybe. We were staying in my sister's loft, and it was, we drove all the way from L.A. to New York to play shows because there was nowhere to play in between in the mm -hmm. whole country. There were no clubs. So we played We played New York. We played with James Chance. Um, I think we played Harass. I, th I thought we played with Blondie, but we might have just been hanging out. We were playing like three shows all the way in November. And then we get offered a show in Philadelphia and a show outside of Pittsburgh. So we do those, play to seven people, whatever. So we're in New York. We're, we're having a really tough time and we have no money. Five people in a car. And we get up in the morning and John looks out the window and he sees a tow truck towing away our, our car, our little uh, international harvester. And he, he's like standing there just in jeans, you know, and he pulls open the big one and he goes, hey, what are you doing? He says, and the guy, the cop looks up, he says, don't run the other way. He goes, it's not a tow-away zone. And the guy goes, hey, all of New York is a tow-away zone. And so that was all the money we made. Oh, Went man. to get our car back. So, Among other things that that song is about, people, not nice people. Johnny Hit and Run Pauline, which has always been one of my favorites. We always had day jobs and we still had jobs. And I think maybe I had just quit my job. John and I had just started living together in this place that Billy used to live at, this house they tore down because it was nice. And um, I wrote Johnny Hit and Run Pauline on a piece of paper and I tacked it up on the wall. John came home from work and saw it and wrote the song. Yeah, I can, I mean, I can explain how Johnny Hit and Run Pauline happened or how it was written, but it doesn't really matter, um, but I would, uh, for that record, I'd give Ray a lot of credit for choosing the songs, because at that, you know, when we made that record, we had most of Wild Gift written as well. He and we all just, uh, you know, focused on on the ones that were there and. Soul Kitchen, what made you want to cover that, that was a Doris specific fan. song? Doris yeah. is my favorite band growing up, you know, yeah. since I was like 12. And then um, when I moved to Venice, I used to think, because before Venice was what it was now, it was just empty. It was like a yeah. lot of vets and a lot of hippies and a lot of burnouts, a lot of gangs. Where I lived was real gangy. And then there was Dogtown, the skate people. And I would walk around and think, well, this is where the doors walked around. And this is where um, all these other people and the silent movie stars. And this is, you know, the Pacific Ocean. And, you know, I would just walk around in the fog and listen to the doors when I got back on the record player. Let me sleep all night in your soul, 
And then I just picked that song and thought we could do it. We tried it. So we started playing yeah, it. And it worked. Ray, how, how did that come about with Ray producing He the saw album? us. Dorothy, his wife, and, and Ray came to see us at the Whiskey and... He said, hey, if you guys want to make a record, let me know. And we were thinking about making a record. I'd read about them uh, in an article that Chris Morris wrote. Ray and uh, The Doors and X have a lot, uh, a lot in common. And um, Ray had been doing Night City. And he'd worked with Iggy on some project and that didn't really Neither one of those really happened, and he was in L.A., and he was reading about what's this thing happening on the Sunset Strip, and it's there's this connection between the band and the audience, and it's like one thing, and then there's this poetry, and he read an article about it, and he went to see this other band called Levi and the Rock Cats. And we were playing with him that night, and... We were already playing Soul Kitchen, and his wife Dorothy said, Hey, Ray, they're playing your guy's song. And he says, What? But because we were playing it, you know, at double time and didn't have the kind of funky, groovy thing that their version of Soul Kitchen had. And he got it, you know? And he said, I, I would love to produce you. And yeah, Ray was a, a real uh, mentor and. You know, maybe to Exine and I more uh, kind of father figure, and yeah, he was he was terrific. I mean, he he was smart enough to get good performances, get pretty decent recordings. Although there was a couple that I could have, <laughs> I think he could have used a better engineer. Um, <laughs> but uh, and and he didn't get in the way. He didn't he didn't he realized that the band by the time you know this is. 79 probably mm -hmm. so we'd already been playing for two years maybe more so we didn't try to you know fix anything that wasn't broken he applied a lot of the um techniques that the doors used um to his to our stuff which is play live play good get the song down get a good performance and move on and i still i still use that when i'm you know recording nowadays do you have any any memories about Ray that stand out? Well, everything about him stands out. Well, first of all, he was a brilliant musician. Let's just oh, talk about oh, of that. Of course. He was great. He's an amazing, amazing composer and musician, as were all four people in that band. That's why that band is so great. You know, obviously, he told us stories, um, and obviously, just getting to know him was great. He's a great human being. His family's great. He's great. Just generous, encouraging, smart, funny, just the best. And he got it. He understood yeah. the whole scene that was happening with punk rock. Is yeah. it? I mean, he came from a totally different uh, era. But you're right; it wasn't. Well, it that wasn't. Long. It was ten years before. Yeah. It was. It was ten years before they were playing the whiskey, just yeah. like us. Eight years before. Seventy six. They when Jim died in what seventy or something. A lot of people like I remember. You know, Frank Sinatra when rock and roll first came out. He got so upset. So it's made by treacherous goons, and he said that. <laughs> But it's interesting because, and a lot of people were like that. They would fight any, like the tsunami that was coming. They would fight that. Mm -hmm. but, but Ray didn't. He was like, let's, let's help this band. Yeah, well, he's an artist, not a guy trying to make a buck. I just remember it went by really quick and that Ray was very encouraging. We goofed off. I, I always goof off too much. Um, <laughs> I remember after he died, I was going up to his funeral in Napa and there was a thing on Sirius Radio I listened to the whole way, which is interviews with him and stuff. And he, Ray was talking about how serious the doors were in the studio. And they did not screw around. Like, they didn't get loaded. They just, they, they worked on those songs endlessly and made them perfect and they performed them. And then they could go and do what they wanted. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, that's, that's interesting. I wish you would have told us that. <laughs> Tell me about the title track. I mean, when you approach this album, not only title track, but approach this album, was it a collection of songs or were you trying to say something as a statement as well? Do you well, remember? you know, John wrote all the words and music for Los Angeles. It was his impression of coming here, you know. But, you know, our friend had moved to England to go live with the damned or something. And, um, and so he put her in there. Get out, get out, get out. 
Los Angeles and Wild Gift, our second record, we were doing all those songs kind of at the same time. So we yeah. just picked the ones we wanted to put out first. I don't, people might not realize this because they don't know about the, those things, but albums have a finite amount of time. So you really, the, the less time on a record, the better it's going to sound because of the um, distance in the grooves and you don't want it, the needle hopping all around. So you want like grooves that are kind of far apart. So 15, 16, 17 minutes aside max. So you can't make a, a 60 minute album unless right. you want to put out two discs, which you couldn't afford back then. And that was also recorded on tape. So that record would cost more now than like um, anybody like in a digital studio would ever have to spend. Right. Because the tape was $300 a reel. So that's like a lot of money in 1980. I think that record cost about $9,000 to make, which yeah. was a lot of money back then. Anyway, so that's why the, those songs are on there because they, we thought they were the best songs cohesively for a first record. Yeah. Yeah. They weren't our only songs. And that's why there's only that many songs on there. You know, people said that we sold out when we signed with Slash Records. Right. So, you know, it's funny because I've thought about that term selling out. And I'm not sure that it was actually used that much before the, that era, for the punk rock yeah. era. It really comes down to, and, and I think we probably, you know, acquiesced to a degree, but we, we didn't want to, we, we weren't like um, Sonic Youth where we were just iconoclasts and, and just did our thing. And don't f with me, I'm doing my thing. We had complete artistic control, but we were always, you know, the songs we wrote and the, and the way that we looked and whatever, we were somewhat accessible, but it was mm -hmm. on our terms. Like, we'll come and be part of your thing, but we still gotta be us. Um, which is why, you know, even though we had several Opportunities like that, you know, being on Dick Clark a couple times, which was, you know, I thought that was cool. Welcome. It's nice to have you here. What happen in the next year to X? Probably be on the road a whole lot. You look forward to that? Oh, yeah. When the, Xene gave him the, the pin. The pin yeah. I like Dick Clark. This is, oh. Thank you. This thing was made in the 1950s. If you can believe that there, how about that? There's a story that Xene yeah. tells about her getting made up for, for that show. And she's thinking like, oh my God, this is so crazy. I'm sitting in a chair and someone's putting makeup on me. This yeah. is, I never in a million years would have thought this had happened, but it's kind of fabulous. So what the, f yeah. you know, life yeah. is, a, is, is a series of experiences. And that, you know, that's kind of my definition of existentialism is to exist to the fullest and just see all the weird shit that can happen. Sex and dying in high society. That's Tell a John that song. One. John was a poet then and a songwriter, and he liked to kind of, uh, I think he was very much into, you know, the Velvet Underground, and, you know, he was very well-read, very yeah. well-educated, and very much into, like, obscure kind of film, and, you know, we all were kind of to some extent, but he really was, so... Yeah, he was kind of making a little movie, I think. That song's like a little movie. You yeah, know, definitely. like a little foreign film. What about the unheard music? Well, that was when we were starting to realize that even then, that you could be the album. Well, we weren't even the album of the year in the LA Times then. It was, I think, wow, is that on that record? That's pretty predictive programming by him. That is like really early on that like, you know, this music is never going to be heard because it's too good and too weird. Not just us. I mean, it's the collective. The world's a mess. It's in my kiss. Yes, I wrote great, that. Great I wrote track. that in Baltimore, my first trip to Baltimore, which was back when Baltimore was Baltimore. The John Waters Baltimore we all know and love. I was just thinking about, the, you know, always as usual, you know, here we are, end times kind of vision of things, you know. And, you know, um, if you want to know if he loves you so, it's in his kiss. So um, if you want to know the world's a mess, it's in my kiss. That's how you can tell. If you kiss me, you'll know the world's a mess. Well, do you remember a specific moment while making this record that sticks out in your mind? Um, we were all, you know, everybody was partying and drinking and having fun. It was a riotous time. We were all 
super elevated awareness consciousness. I'm not saying we were smart. I'm just saying like everything was tingling at the top of its yeah. level of experience. So it was hard to moments just flew by. Everything just flew through your experiences so quickly. Every car ride, every gig, every moment, every drink, every person, every meeting with people, just like young people, you know, it's just like that. It's just this riotous chaos, you know, at times. K-Rock. K-Rock was around and Rodney Bingenheimer, Rodney on the Rock, played X, he played the Ramones, he played Blondie, he played this, he played that. Radio programming people all over the country are looking to this kind of music. Does it make you happy, yeah. finally? Well, it's about time. And they played... I mean, I think we went straight from Rodney Bingenheimer to Flashback Lunch. You yeah. know, I think in between maybe once in a while they'd sneak one in. It's been a hard fight. Yeah, well, it's not just us. There's a lot of bands in America that should be on the radio that aren't. We'd also, you know, we had achieved a lot. You know, we had achieved, uh, like we had sold out the, the Greek theater, which is almost six, 7,000 people, you know. And we were on Slash Records. We put out L.A. and Wild Gift, and, and it's like, huh. I guess we're not so bad, you know, but we didn't feel like we were something. We felt like we were still underdogs and struggling and, you know, doing the best we could. And, you know, it was like, we had no idea why Joe Smith, the head of Electra at that point signed us. No idea. It's like, <laughs> okay, maybe we'll get our records in record stores instead of not. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we had the total, you know, uh, spinal tap experience where we go, to, we go to a like in-store signing that we would be met by the person who's the head of the record store and say, um, "Guys, you know, there's a little problem. We don't have any records. I, I know that's really weird, and actually, there's only eight people here, <laughs> but it's going to be great." Yeah, and you're going like, "Oh." What can I tell you? This is the truth. I know business is terrible, but, but what happens with a, with a record star with a promotion and nobody shows up? <laughs> I f***ing hate Slash Records, which was not really their fault. They just had, you yeah. know, they didn't have Warner Brothers distribution at that right. point or whatever. They just couldn't, you know, it was like there were a lot of things to, like I say, there was no real network. Here's the thing that's hard um, for most people to comprehend. And it's something that if you're if you're a mature kind of like together person at towards more of the end of your life, you can, you can do this. You're going to make all this, you're going to do all this stuff in your life and it's going to be super influential. All these artists, all these bands, all these people are going to tell you that it was the greatest thing. It changed their life. It saved their life. If it wasn't for you, they never would have started a band. If it wasn't for you, they would not be superstars. If it wasn't for you, they never would have met their husband. When their sister died, you got them through that. They, you know, their mother shared that music with them. The whole family loves the band, but not make any money is okay. And that's where a lot of people would rather flip it and say, yeah. I'd rather have millions and millions of dollars and be famous. I don't care about that other stuff. Now, it'd be nice if you could have all of that. And we all wish we could. But artists don't usually get a career like ours where it's longevity and meaningful, uh, you know, 40 years of meaningful mm -hmm. relationships with people. Mm -hmm. um, and so you kind of have to just roll with that and say, you know what? If I had to pick between the two, I'd pick that. Pretty mind blowing when you consider that Exene is a grandmother now. She told me that when I was interviewing her. I was like, mind blown. Make sure to leave us a comment about this amazing band. What are your thoughts on the incredible debut album? One of the best ever. What are your memories of X? Did you have their debut album? Have you ever heard of them? What are your memories that are tied to these songs? Let's have a great discussion in the comments. Make sure to get your tickets for Professor of Rock Live. It's coming up. We'd love to meet you. The link is below. Make sure to subscribe to be as part of our, our spirit of radio here. Check out our merch as well. It's all about keeping the music alive. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.